Hey, welcome to Scanner School. This is session number 127. Today, we're talking about Yagi antennas. And before we start this week's podcast, I want to thank the supporters of Scanner School. So whether you're going to scannerschool.com slash support and you're supporting us at a one-time donation by going to PayPal, maybe you're using our Amazon links before you make a purchase on Amazon. If you're looking for new hardware, you're using our Scanner Master links, or even if you're using Butel software, before you make that purchase, you go and use our Butel links and our brand new eBay links if you're looking for used equipment. Your support helps keep the podcast going. I also want to thank those who help support us on Patreon. Now, Patreon is a month-over-month type of sponsorship platform, and there's three different tiers. The first tier for a buck a month, you're just help, helping to support us. And really, at the Patreon takes there is we're only getting pennies on a dollar, to be honest with you. At $3 a month, you're going to get the podcast delivered to you early. You get your own private podcast feed that you can actually get the podcast as soon as it's available. At the $5 level, you not only get the $3 level, but you also get squelchy stickers mailed directly to your home. Because at $5 a month, it really equates to being about a dollar a week or a dollar per podcast is really what you're you're giving us. So again, I want to thank my Patreon supporters who are Craig Harper, Dan, Glenn Blum, Glenn Bryden, Guy Lee, Irvin Thibodeau, James Felling, Jeff Bach, Jenny Taylor, John Goldenberg, Ken Newberry, Kenneth Fowler, Mark Beebe, Raymond Hill, Richard Armstrong, Ronnie Bach, Sal Marandola, Scott Vorder, Signals Everywhere, Todd Glendie, and William Arcand. Let's start the podcast. Welcome to The Scanner School, a podcast dedicated to the scanner radio hobby. Class is about to begin. Here is your host, Phil Lichtenberger. Welcome to Scanner School. My name is Phil Lichtenberger. My amateur radio call sign is W2LIE, and this is Scanner School, where we teach you everything you need to know about the scanner radio hobby. If you're joining us again, thank you for coming back and listening to Scanner School. But if this is your first time here, why don't you go ahead and hit subscribe so the podcast is automatically delivered to you every single week. Now, last week we talked about polarization, and I intentionally put that podcast ahead of this one. Now, again, polarization really isn't an exciting topic, and unfortunately, I feel like after re-listening that episode, I didn't give it my best. So I do apologize for that. But this week, we're back. We're back on top of things. And this is really an interesting topic, so I really am excited to talk to you about this one. It's a little bit hard to explain without some visuals, but I think we can work through this. So a Yagi antenna, simply put, it's a directional antenna that has at least two elements mounted on a boom. Typically, you'll find them with three elements, okay? The three elements are a driven element, a reflector element, and a director element. Now, the driven, reflector, and director elements are all mounted on the same plane on the boom. Meaning if the driven element is mounted vertically, then the reflector and the director are also mounted vertically. The elements are both top and bottom. Basically, they go through the boom. Now, that's on a vertical antenna, but if they were horizontal, if it's a horizontally polarized antenna, then the elements would go straight through side to side across the boom. So again, this is where polarization kind of dictates the way that the hardware is physically mounted to the boom of the antenna. And again, if you want a refresher on what antenna polarization is, check out last week's podcast at scannerschool.com slash session 126. Now, before we get into the elements, let's talk about what the Yagi is, who it's named after, and a little bit more of the history of the antenna. So the Yagi Yuda antenna, or maybe the Yagi Uda antenna, is commonly known just as the Yagi antenna. And it's a directional antenna that has, again, like I said, two to three parallel elements in a single line or plane. The Yagi antenna was invented by, now I'm going to butcher the name here. It's a Japanese name. It's Shintaro Uda and Hidetsugu Yagi. I, I really apologize to them for butchering the names. You know, the deceased is still the memory of them. My translations really, really are horrible. 
even reading in English was never a strong point to me. So now you start adding in multiple languages and it gets really, really tough. But uh, Uda or Yuda was a Japanese inventor and an assistant professor at Yagi at Tohoku University. Now, Yagi was a Japanese electrical engineer. Now, Yagi and Yuda published their wave projector antenna, is what they called it. In a Japanese publication in 1926, and Yagi applied for patents on this new antenna design in both Japan and the U.S. Now, the variable directional electric wave generating device was issued a U.S. patent in 1932 and was assigned to the Radio Corporation of America, a.k.a. RCA. And the rest is all basic history, right? So... If you don't know what a Yagi antenna looks like, let me explain as best as I can so we can paint a picture in your head. So a Yagi antenna is basically, if you think about a TV antenna that used to be on our homes where we all had you know, analog TV, it was something similar to that, right? The antennas were on a boom, oh, the antennas on a boom, and you have elements that go through it. And you'll see them basically on... A lot of homes, but a lot of them coming down, right? And you'll also find them on a communications tower. Now, in communications towers, you'll find a lot of vertical Yagi antennas. Many amateur radio operators also use Yagi antennas for HF operations. And again, as scanner radio users, we use the Yagi antennas to kind of put our signal into one direction. It's great for eliminating things off to the side. It's great for eliminating things off the back, but Yagis are really good for bringing your your beam, focusing it straight ahead, off the front of the Yagi. Now, how do you know the front and the back of the Yagi antenna? We'll cover that in just one second, okay? But it is directional in a certain direction, right? So, again, we have uses for Yagi antennas in the scanner radio hobby. One of them can be just to bring in signals in a particular area. Say I wanted to pick up a state away from me. I could theoretically point a Yagi antenna towards that direction and possibly bring in those signals. Or if I had a simulcast issue, I could try to use a Yagi antenna and swing it to my closest tower or maybe away from my closest tower into another direction to try to eliminate some of the simulcasting issues. Again, with simulcast, you want to limit what you're receiving, right? You want to just get the best signal. If you don't have a scanner like the SDS-100 or 200, that knows how to put things back together again. So on the other side of this break, we're going to talk about the construction of a Yagi antenna and how you can even make one at home. I'll be right back. This session of Scanner School is sponsored by East Coast Pagers. Now, East Coast Pagers is one of my online companies, and we are a Unication, Apollo, and Swiss phone dealers serving the North American market. Now, if you're looking for a personal use pager or one for your department, we can get you a quote at the very best prices. So why does a company like East Coast Pagers support Scanner School? I think that every Scanner Radio user should at least put one pager in their collection of radios. The reason why is very simple. It frees up your scanner to just do scanning, and then you have one radio that's dedicated to your local fire activity. Now, with a pager, you can have voice storage. You can do tone outs. You can keep it silent. You can go back the next day and listen to what you've missed overnight. It's more than you can do with an out-of-the-box scanner. And with today's pagers having multiple frequencies and even having multiple channels in a scan list, like the Unication G1 can do eight channels in a scan list. It has 64 memory channels, and out of the box, it comes with 11 minutes of stored voice and a desktop charger. The G2s to G5s, they do P25 phase one and phase two in simulcast environments with stored voice, paging on conventional NP25. Oh, and they're upgradable too to DMR type one and type two. They are more rugged than today's consumer based scanners. And with a pager like a Swiss phone S quad, you won't even realize you're wearing one. It'll help keep you informed as to what's going on in your neighborhood. So again, eastcoastpagers.com or contact me directly, phil at eastcoastpagers.com. Do you have a new scanner? You're having problems understanding how it works? Maybe you're new to the entire Home Patrol database of programming and you can't figure out Sentinel. 
Did you get a new SDR and you're trying to figure out how to install it or you want to learn how to use Unitrunker, DSD+, Plus, maybe set up a Pioware, or even just make some changes and you don't understand how the system and the equipment works? The podcast might be great for you, but maybe you need a little bit more of one-on-one help with setting something up. I'm available to do just that with you with our private tutoring sessions. You can book me online by going to scannerschool.com slash consulting for a one-hour session. And it's great because we can actually share computer screens remotely, and I can guide you through step-by-step as if I was sitting right next to you. So again, book me for an hour at scannerschool.com slash consulting for your scanner radio one-on-one tutoring session. National Communications Magazine is your personal library of scanner, CB, GMRS, FRS, MURS, and two-way radio articles written by the best minds in the business over the past three decades. Your NatCom personal online access account allows you to download the newest issues of America's Hobby Radio Magazine, as well as back issues too. So visit natcommag.com to download your free sample issues and sign up today. That's natcommag.com for National Communications Magazine. Okay, so let's talk about the parts of the Yagi antenna and how they're laid out in order to make things directional. So obviously, you've got the boom. The boom is the horizontal structure that everything's mounted to, including your mast. Okay, so your mast and all the elements are mounted to the boom. The main element on a Yagi antenna is called the driven element. This is what your feed line is connected to. Now, behind the driven element, you have parasitic element called the reflector. And in front of the driven element, you have parasitic elements called the directors. So let's back up one second here. Behind the driven element is the reflector. Now, the reflector is about 5% larger than the driven element. It is slightly off resonance of the frequency you want to be using, all right? Meaning that the RF hits that reflector, it's not right, and it pushes the RF forward, kind of, sort of, all right? It bounces It bounces the, the, the R frequency back and, and off the reflector, right? Now, the driven elements, again, they're also parasitic, meaning that they aren't connected to the feed line. All right, and they're about five percent smaller than the act the, the driver itself. And the more driven elements you have, obviously, the longer the antenna becomes, but also the more gain you get, but at the cost of the bandwidth. We'll talk about that in just one second. But again, these are parasitic. Okay, they're not directly driven by the antenna itself, by your feline. So how exactly do the parasitic elements work? Now, they operate by re-radiating the signal, the RF, in a slightly different phase from the driven element. And these signals, again, getting a little bit technical here, but they're super poised and they kind of interfere with each other in a way that enhances the radiation into a single direction. Again, they're slightly out of phase, they add up together, and they add directivity to your antenna. Now, we said before, the reflector is the longest point of the antenna, and that is the only one that sits behind the driven element. There's only one reflector. And then in front of the driven element, you have all the directional, the director elements, right? Again, so that's how you tell the direction the antenna goes in. The longest element sits behind the driven element. That's the back of the antenna. So again, there's two things we want to keep in mind here when we talk about Yagi antennas. Obviously, the lower the frequency, the larger the elements are going to be on it, okay? There's going to be spacing involved too, and there's a little bit of math in that. We'll talk about that in one second. But the more directors you have in the array, the more gain you will get. I'm going to say this again for the third time. This is this, this was the second time I said this. The third time. The more directors, the more the gain. But the more gain, the smaller the frequency bandwidth you would have on a Yagi. 
So because of this, Yagi antennas are typically built with a single center frequency in mind, a very small bandwidth. For example, you may buy a Yagi that's for 850 megahertz, and that will only go down to, say, 845 to 855, something just as an example. I'm not saying that's the rule of thumb because there are Yagi antennas that will cover from 806 to 906 or something like that, all right, that cover the 800 range. So let's talk about Yagis and polarization to kind of tie in what we talked about last week. So again, a vertically polarized Yagi antenna is the most common polarization when it comes to the VHF and UHF, including the 700-800 spectrum, that we use in the scanner radio world, right? Again, two-way radio, commercial two-way radio, public safety two-way radio is vertically polarized. The elements are mounted up and down. They're mounted vertically. Now, in horizontal polarization, again, the elements would be horizontal. They would be parallel to the Earth's horizon. This is the most kind of, uh, this is the most popular Antenna when it comes to amateur radio HF, right? These are the the boom, the 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 giant, you know, ten foot element antennas you will see, and they're usually mounted on a tower or on a roof, and they all are also paired with a rotor so that you can actually point the antenna to wherever you want to communicate. Now, finally, you can have a cross pole. Yagi antenna, and I, these are very popular when it comes to amateur radio and using satellites. And they're cool in a way because you don't really have a UHF cross pole, but what you have is on one plane you've got a UHF Yagi, and on the other plane you have a VHF Yagi antenna. So you'd have elements sticking out of both both planes, and you kind of use it. Or you could twist the antenna a bit and change the polarity on it. Remember. Satellites are spinning around in orbit. Their polarities are constantly changing, right? So that's why we usually would try to use a circular polarized antenna when we try and communicate with a satellite. But for the amateur radio world, if you don't have an egg beater or helix antenna, you can use these Yagi antennas as well. And they work very well. And they're pretty much handheld. They're a little heavy at the end. So sometimes even using just a camera tripod works very well for that. So again, you can kind of, cross pole the Yagi antenna, though typically it is done for two different bands and for special cases like this. Now, what if you wanted to build your own Yagi antenna? You can do that. Now, it's a very fun project to play around with. Now, there's a couple of great resources out there on building your own Yagi antennas. And if, again, you're looking for something to do, this will be a fun little project. We'll put some links in the session notes. Again, scannerschool.com slash session 127. And one of those links is to what we call a tape measure Yagi antenna. This is where you go to the home store, you buy a piece of PVC as the boom, and then you buy some tapping screws or whatever else you want to use, and you buy a like 25-foot long tape measure. And you cut the elements of the tape measure. You, you, you cut the tape measure making the elements. You screw them into the boom, which is the PVC pipe, and before you know it, you've got your own Built at home Yagi antenna. It's pretty. I've never built one of them, but I've seen plenty in there, and they're actually really cool. But if you want to get a little bit more high tech with it, you can actually go online and find calculators that'll tell you the boom length. It'll tell you the spacing between the elements. It'll tell you the length of each element and everything you need to know on how to put one together. So again, we'll put a link in the session notes. But one of them I want to tell you about right now is uh, wa 2 dot com slash Yagi calculator.html. Again, we're going to link to this anyway in the session notes, scannerschool.com slash session 127. So again, if you build your own Yagi antenna, I'd love to see it. And you can post it online on our Instagram account or share it with our Instagram account. Share it with us on Twitter, on the Facebook group. is a great place to share it, scannerschool.com slash Facebook group. But if it's something you don't want to build and you just want to go out and buy a Yagi antenna pre-made, we got a link for you, scannerschool.com slash Yagi, Y-A-G-I. Now, that will point you right to Scanner Master as an affiliate. They've got 800 megahertz Yagi antennas starting at about $50. Now, VHF and UHF are slightly higher, 
but for eight, for 50 bucks to get you something that you can play around with and maybe pick up a trunk system that's just outside your reach or to try to use to eliminate some simulcast, 50 bucks really isn't all that expensive when it comes to playing around with antennas. So again, scannerschool.com slash Yagi. So how did I do today? Did I explain this well enough to you? Let me know. Send me some feedback. Again, you can comment on this podcast at scannerschool.com slash session 127. And remember, join us every Tuesday on our Zello net, scannerschool.com slash Zello. Now, Scanner School is copyright 2020, Monitor Long Island, Inc. Again, I'm Phil Lichtenberger. My radio call sign is W2LIE. And this is Scanner School, where we teach you everything that you need to know about the scanner radio hobby. We'll catch you all again next week on the podcast, and maybe even tonight, if it's Tuesday, on our Zello chat. Talk to you all later. 73.